Hello comrades. This video is something that people have been requesting for a long time. Every now and then there's somebody who requests that I do a video about this topic, which is how the Soviet government was organized, or how the Soviet electoral system was organized. So I'm gonna actually combine those two things, so I'm gonna look at the way the government was set up and then also the electoral system. However, I will focus on the Stalin era since the 1936 constitution, also known as the Stalin constitution, is probably the most influential Soviet constitution. It was built to a large degree on the 1924 constitution, but it still changed a lot of things and introduced a lot of new things, and um, many of the things introduced in the Stalin constitution remained in the Soviet Union for a long time. As far as I know, after the Stalin constitution, there was only the 77 constitution, which still kept uh, most of those fundamental laws and things like that. There were really only massive changes in the Gorbachev era. So I'm going to be focusing on the Stalin era constitution, because it's the most influential and also, for me, the most interesting. However, I will also kind of compare it to the two constitutions that were made previously, the 1918 and 1924 constitution, and how the government was organized in the Lenin era versus the Stalin era. So the Soviet governmental system was actually pretty complicated for a number of reasons which should become evident in the course of this video. So basically, in 1917, the October Revolution, the Bolsheviks come to power, they overthrow the capitalist provisional government, and in the capitalist provisional government there was a parliament called the Constituent Assembly, although the capitalists were planning on creating a pre-parliament, actually I think they created a pre-parliament, and they, they were trying to like change it, make it less democratic, even less democratic than what it was or whatnot, but basically the Bolsheviks initially took over the Constituent Assembly, the parliament, but they ended up dissolving it. And what they replaced it with was the All-Russian Congress of Soviets. So from the beginning of the Lenin government, the supreme governing body of the Russian FSSR, as it was called, so Russian Soviet Federative Socialist Republic was what it was called at the time. The supreme governing body of that from 1917 to 1936 was the All-Russian Congress of Soviets. And the All-Russian Congress of Soviets meant that the local Soviets, local councils, elect people and send them to the All-Russia Congress of Soviets, which made laws and decisions and stuff like that. But between its sessions, there were 12 of these um, congresses in total, so the Congress of Soviets was not in session all the time. And between the sessions of the All-Russian Congress of Soviets, the highest legislative organ and um, basically the administrative organ was something called the All-Russian Central Executive Committee, or the VTSIK. So that was the administrative body and the highest legislative and revising body of the Russian SFSR when the All-Russia Congress of Soviets was not in session. So, Congress makes the laws, but the Central Executive Committee runs the government um, all the time, except when the Congress is making new laws and new decisions and stuff. And then, the third big thing they had was the Council of People's Commissars, which was created in 1922, although it did exist in the Civil War as well, but basically in 1922 it was made a official part of the government, as a kind of a permanent recognized thing, and then it was recognized in the 1920s constitution and stuff like that. So, what exactly is the Council of People's Commissars? Well, People's Commissariats were basically similar to what we would consider ministries, and this was a major executive organ of the government, a major executive branch of the government. So there would be the People's Commissariat of Agriculture, People's Commissariat of Defense, People's Commissariat of this or that. Trotsky was the People's Commissar of, I think they called it Defense. Uh, Stalin was the People's Commissar of a bunch of different things. Nationalities, and I think 
what was the other thing? He was two things at the same time. It was nationalities and... Maybe it was internal affairs, I can't remember. Maybe it was foreign affairs. I'll put a text because I can't remember, but... He was also People's Commissar of the Workers and Peasants Inspection, or Workers and Peasants Inspectorate, which was a anti-corruption body. We'll look at that a bit later. So in 1917, they just quickly like came up with these first immediate kind of government organs. It wasn't exactly codified, it wasn't exactly polished and worked out, and then the constitution they drew up quickly just um, talked about those, and in the 20s they came up with a more formalized and more detailed system. And then in the 30s, 1936, they went all through the country and they asked people what would you like to be in this new constitution and what would you like to be in this new state and stuff like that and um, people were able to participate and send letters or be interviewed and um, voice their opinions in the discussion about this new constitution and then this new constitution was drawn up and it introduced a number of changes so the Soviet Union as a country came into existence in 1923. Six years after the revolution, the Soviet Union actually becomes a country. Before that, there was the Russian Soviet Federative Socialist Republic. And then finally, the civil war is over and they decide we are going to merge a bunch of these republics into a federation. And not merely a federation, but the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics that we know. In this new Soviet Union, according to this 1936 Stalin constitution, the highest legislative organ was the Supreme Soviet. It used to be the All-Russian Congress of Soviets, but now it's the Supreme Soviet. And the Supreme Soviet had two chambers with equal rights to make laws. First chamber was the Soviet of the Union, where deputies would be elected by people based on electoral areas, one deputy for every 300,000 people, and they would be elected for four years. The other chamber was the Soviet of Nationalities, and in that people would elect deputies on the basis of 25 deputies from each Union Republic, 11 deputies from each Autonomous Republic, 5 deputies from each Autonomous Region, and one deputy from each National Area. In the Soviet of the Union, you would decide union-wide things. And in the Soviet of Nationalities, you would represent your individual republic, such as Ukrainian Republic or Georgian Republic or Russian Republic, or an autonomous republic. They had many different kinds of republics. Union republics were the ones that were considered big enough, and also border republics. For example, Ukraine. Ukraine could be a union republic because it was big enough and a border republic and the reason for that was that union republics had the right to secede so they thought that it would be pointless to grant the ability to secede to some country if it was so small that it could never defend itself and it could never economically sustain itself alone also, if it wasn't a border republic, because what's the point of seceding if you're entirely landlocked inside another country, you know? So then they had autonomous republics, which were not quite as powerful, but still pretty powerful, and autonomous regions, which were much smaller. Probably the most well-known would be the Birobijan Jewish Autonomous Oblast, or Autonomous Region. So basically this pretty big area with a substantial Jewish minority. And then national areas... And all this stuff of autonomous republics and autonomous regions and union republics and national areas, the point was to grant cultural and national and actual political rights to oppressed nationalities. Every ethnic group was thus recognized, and um, this was done to win them over, because in the Russian Empire, Russia used to be called the prison house of nations, and none of the ethnic and cultural minorities were recognized. They were all oppressed and marginalized, and only the Russians were recognized. So they had two chambers, one for the entire union, one for individual areas. Both of these chambers elect a chairman and two vice chairmen, and the chairmen preside over the sittings and direct the procedure. Sessions were convened by the Presidium of the Supreme Soviet twice a year, 
although additional special sessions could also be convened by the Presidium if it wanted to do so, or at the request of a Union Republic. If there was some immediate concern, then they could have a special session. The Presidium of the Supreme Soviet interpreted the laws in operation, issued decrees, etc., and it was elected by the Supreme Soviet at a joint sitting of both chambers. Supreme Soviet has these two chambers and it has a presidium which is like a special organ or committee elected by it which is kind of the leading body although not exactly because it's still the deputies in the Supreme Soviet that make the laws and not the presidium. The presidium just runs the things and the presidium included a president of the presidium of the Supreme Soviet 16 vice presidents. I thought that was quite interesting. They had 16 vice presidents and a secretary of the Presidium of the Supreme Soviet and 24 members of the Presidium of the Supreme Soviet. Very collective decision making. It wasn't just Stalin alone in the Presidium or Molotov alone in the Presidium. No, it was a big bunch of people. The Council of People's Commissars, that still remained from the Lenin government to the Stalin government. Although it was changed from 1946 onwards to something else, and I'm going to talk about that a bit later. The Council of People's Commissars of the USSR were appointed by the Supreme Soviet, and the Council of People's Commissars consisted of the chairman of the Council of People's Commissars of the USSR, the vice chairman, the chairman of the State Planning Commission, the chairman of the Soviet Control Commission, the actual People's Commissars of the USSR, the chairman of the Committee on Arts, the chairman of the Committee on Higher Education, and the chairman of the Board of the State Bank. And these were kind of the ministers, if you will. The Council of People's Commissars in 1946, it was actually changed to the Council of Ministers. And there's a bit of back and forth. You had the People's Commissars, but then you had uh, things like Chairman of the State Planning Commission. So the State Planning Commission wasn't a People's Commissariat. It was a separate kind of thing, but still similar. Still basically like a ministry, but not a People's Commissariat. And sometimes in the history of the USSR, some things would be changed from a ministry to a commission of some kind, or sometimes they would be changed from a commission to a ministry or to a people's commissar, like what, what not, but still basically those were kind of the ministries. And each republic also had their own CPC or Council of People's Commissars. There was, once again, the all-union Council of People's Commissars, so the entire Soviet Union-wide thingy, and then each republic had their own as well. That also included the chairman of the Council of People's Commissars of the Union Republic, vice chairman, chairman of the State Planning Commission, and then representatives of the all Union People's Commissariats. Then, the actual People's Commissars, because now we just covered the Council of People's Commissars, but now let's get to the actual Commissariats and the actual Commissars. There were both all Union and Republican Commissariats, Republican as in associated with one particular republic instead of the whole Soviet Union. So I'm not going to go through all of them because there are so many, but to give you an idea, in the All Union People's Commissariats, there were things like the People's Commissariat of Defense, you know, makes sense, it's the military, People's Commissariat of Foreign Trade, People's Commissariat of Foreign Affairs, although they did in the 40s they accepted an amendment to the constitution which granted the individual republics also to have a commissar of foreign trade and foreign affairs because they realized that the economic level and economic significance of the individual countries was so great that they needed to have their own commissariats for, for these things. You couldn't have the all-union commissariat facilitate all the foreign trade and the diplomatic ties of the individual countries. The individual countries had to start doing it themselves. People's Commissariat of Railways and other such various industries, communications, agriculture, stuff like that. A lot of things. Now, if we look at the Union Republican People's Commissariat, so the individual countries, individual republics, commissariats, they also had the various industries and whatnot, but it was somewhat different from the all-union commissariats. They had a commissariat of finance, trade, international affairs, 
public health, justice, and all those things that you need, but they didn't have commissariat of heavy industry. They only had a commissariat of light industry, and they didn't have a commissariat of defense or anything like that. So the defense and heavy industry and stuff like that was all union. The things with the most like vital necessity were all union. Okay, so that's basically the government. So now, before moving on to the election system, let's take a quick look at a couple other things, such as the intelligence service. So, the first intelligence service that the Soviets had was called the Cheka, or the Emergency Committee, headed by Zerzinski. And that was in existence from 1917 to 1922. Intelligence, counterintelligence, fought the counter-revolutionaries, a militant organ of the proletariat to crush bourgeois, reactionaries, and counter-revolutionaries, apart from the actual war. So they would stop saboteurs and spies and bourgeois conspirators, white guard conspirators and assassins and people like that, kulak rebellions, they would crack down on those kinds of things. So that was from 1917 to 1922. It was um, shut down because it was a emergency committee created for the war. And in 1922, they instead created the GPU, or State Political Directorate. And that was only in existence for one year until it was merged into a bigger thing which was called the OGPU, or OGPU, Joint State Political Directorate. And that existed from 1923 to 1934, and that was under the authority of the Council of People's Commissars, even though it wasn't a commissariat itself, it was a different thing. In 34-35, there was another reorganization reform. Joint State Political Directorate was kind of reorganized and changed into two things. There was the GUGB, Main Directorate of State Security, which was an intelligence service, and then that was under the bigger thing, which was the NKVD, People's Commissariat of Internal Affairs. So the NKVD was a People's Commissariat. All the republics had their own NKVD. Another thing I found pretty interesting was the RKI, also known as the Workers and Peasants Inspectorate, and that was created in 1920, and it uh, lasted until 34. And that was a body whose function was basically to make the government run more efficiently, more smoothly, minimize inefficiency, and expose and get rid of corruption. And Stalin was made the head of that right from the beginning. In 23, Lenin famously, he wrote how we should reorganize the uh, Workers and Peasants Inspectorate. And Stalin was, once again, made the head of that newly created, newly organized RKI. Basically, if you read what Lenin wrote, it's called Better, Fewer, But Better. It's kind of an awkward title, but what it uh, what it talks about and what it means is that they should do less, but do it better. He's kind of saying that the government is super amateurish, and they need to make it more professional and better and more efficient. And that's why they need to reorganize the RKI and make all the things run better, and they need to more and more get rid of the bourgeois experts and bourgeois managers and whatnot in peacetime that they have eliminated the immediate threat of military annihilation. They don't need to run around like chickens with their heads cut off, but rather they need to plan better and do less but do it better. And how Lenin envisaged it was that these inspectors from the RKI could, for example, they could go to all government institutions at any time and audit them or just observe them as they work. And they wouldn't tell about this beforehand, they would just knock on the door like, hello, it's the RKI, we've come to check how you're doing. They wouldn't let them know beforehand so they could really get a good idea of how it's running and how it's organized and managed. And they actually did expose a lot of corruption. Two main evils, there was real corruption and lack of skill in the people who were running things. And those were, they were trying to combat those problems. It was under the CPC or the Council of People's Commissariats, although it wasn't a commissariat. It was a separate thing created by the Central Executive Committee. Because remember, this is before the Stalin Constitution, so the Central Executive Committee is still the thing that runs the government. 
But eventually in 1934 it was dissolved and its functions were turned over to the People's Control Commission, as it was called. Final thing before we move on to the election process and election system that I want to talk about was the state committees and other similar things. So I already mentioned the RKI, but there were other similar governmental organizations that were not People's Commissariats and still typically under the control of the Council of People's Commissariats. For example, the OGPU Joint State Political Directorate was under the CPC, even though it wasn't a commissariat, and then, once again, NKVD um, was a commissariat. So sometimes they changed things like that. There was the State Planning Committee, which was uh, a separate entity, though it was under the CPC, it wasn't a commissariat. When the Council of People's Commissariats was changed to Council of Ministers, the State Planning Committee was still not a ministry, it was a separate thing under the Council of Ministers. Similarly, the State Defense Committee, uh, although the State Defense Committee only existed during the Second World War for obvious reasons, and then other things like the State Committee for Cinematography. When film became a bigger thing, they created a separate committee for film. Okay. I already talked about how people were elected to the Supreme Soviet and the Presidium. Who selects the People's Commissars and the Council of People's Commissars? The Council of People's Commissars was appointed by the Supreme Soviet, if you remember. Okay, then Supreme Soviet, how do you get to the Supreme Soviet? Or let's say you want to be in the Presidium of the Supreme Soviet. The Presidium is elected by the Supreme Soviet from within its own ranks. So how do you get there then? Every four years there's elections and you can run in those elections. There were a bunch of candidates, but the candidates were selected by the people. So chances are if you're a capitalist or a massive Nazi or something, then you probably won't be selected as a candidate. This was a deliberate thing to stop right-wingers from being able to run. And uh, we'll get to the right-wing and liberal criticism of this system at the end. Let's look at the local Soviets, because that's um, pretty interesting. So, the local Soviets, or Soviets of Working People's Deputies, as they were called, are basically what they were in 1917, and even before that. I don't know why, but there's this crazy idea that anarchists have. They tend to accuse Lenin of abolishing the worker councils immediately when he came to power. And I don't understand where that idea comes from, because he never did that. The local Soviets, you can clearly see in this system how the Soviets in the Lenin government selected delegates to the Congress of Soviets, which was the highest legislative organ of the country. In fact, the sole legislative organ of the country. So, it's like, they, they say the Soviets had no power, or the Soviets were, were eliminated. There was basically nothing else than the Soviets. All there was, was the Congress of Soviets, then the Central Executive Committee, selected by the Soviets, selected by the Congress, and then the People's Commissariats. And the Stalin-era system was a direct continuation of that, so they had the all Union Supreme Soviet, the Republican Supreme Soviets, and then they had the local Soviets. So the local Soviets, Soviets of Working People's Deputies, which were not abolished, they they were not, they still existed. They elected people every two years, so more often than the Supreme Soviet, and the local Soviets would elect an executive committee. And this executive committee was a chairman, multiple vice chairman, a secretary and members, members of the executive committee. And once again, anarchists might criticize this, like, why do you have to elect people? Why can't you just have everybody decide everything? But if this is like the equivalent of a city council, do you really think that every single member of the city can do this? It is an administrative job, serious work. I don't think that kind of a criticism is realistic or serious. I, I see no problem in the fact that you elect people to administrate Especially if it's only for two years and you can recall them, so if they're doing something crazy nefarious, just vote against them and impeach them. The thing, some people, they romanticize 
the ability to have recall and stuff like that. The trouble with recall is that you need to get enough people to recall them. So if people don't care, then that's another thing, then they won't be recalled. But if they do something egregious enough, then, you know, you would think that people would care, and they would be impeached. And what I described earlier was a typical local Soviet, but in the more rural, small villages and more sparsely populated areas, what they called small localities, the executive committee was only three people, so it was a chairman, a vice chairman, and a secretary. So if the place didn't have too many people, then it was only three person executive committee. Otherwise, it would be much bigger, depending on the population. Now, the actual Soviet elections. So, the candidates would be selected and um, they wouldn't have to accept, but they uh, would be nominated and then they could accept or, or not accept. They were nominated by organizations of the Communist Party, of course, but also trade unions. Huge amounts of people were part of the trade unions. The Komsomol, which was the communist youth, and once again, vast amounts of people, probably the majority, belonged to the Komsomol in their youth. Uh, cooperatives, and again, most people were in a cooperative. Majority of the population were collective farmers, and those were cooperatives, and there were other kinds of cooperatives as well. Uh, and then other kinds of public organizations, and also military units. Uh, military units could also nominate people from among them. Members of the military could also vote, and um, they also wanted that members of the military could run. So that's why military units would also be able to nominate candidates. But basically the point of this system was that it is a collective system. It's always a group of people who nominate somebody, whether they be local Communist Party branch, local trade union branch, local consumal branch, local cooperative. If your village has a cooperative of some kind of farm or a factory, they nominate somebody. Other kinds of public organizations, so women's groups, whatnot. So, why was this considered undemocratic by liberals and anti-communists? The reason seems obvious, because it makes it harder for right-wingers to be able to run. All the right-wingers who were elected were only elected because they fooled people into thinking they were not right-wingers. This made it more difficult for an open capitalist to be elected. So that's why anti-communists don't like it. Opposition parties were not allowed. That's another key component. So in the elections, only two groups ran. Communists or independents. And the common slogan was vote for the bloc of communist and non-party masses. So you didn't have to be a member of the Communist Party to run, but you could be. For instance, in 1937, after the creation of the new constitution, communists got roughly 80% of the yes votes, and independents got roughly 20%. Important democratic features in these elections that were not present in other countries, or in Russia previously, were that women were able to vote, all ethnic groups could vote, all religious groups could vote. It was a secret ballot, so nobody knew who you voted for, except you. It was a direct vote, so there was no electoral college the way they have in the US, where you vote for an elector who elects for you. Finland also used to have a system like that. We would vote for a elector, and then that elector would vote for the actual president, and you could never really know who that guy was going to actually vote for, even though he says one thing, he might vote for another guy. In the Soviet Union, they had a direct system. You vote directly. So, universal suffrage, secret ballot, and equal vote. So, everybody only has one vote, and everybody's vote is equal. So the Soviet system and the Soviet constitution which guaranteed these rights was notable in its democratic character and progressive character. Other countries didn't recognize women's right to vote necessarily. They certainly did not recognize the rights of ethnic and religious minorities. The US had segregation until the 60s. When we're talking about the Soviet elections, we're talking about the 30s. Can you honestly think of any country that had these kinds of progressive laws in the 30s? 
parks after dark by candlelight. 